everybody here we are again welcome back this is woodworking wisdom my name's colin way and today we're looking at resin resin and call it a twig pot it's more like a little branch pot so um we've got ben on the switching and the cameras and ask uh, or asking me all the questions that you ask him so make sure that you ask loads of questions i'm sure being resin there's going to be loads of them i have mentioned um in the past couple of weeks that we're going to do some more fun projects so we've got the um the big day probably around about five months away i'm not going to mention it it's the c word um so for now before we get into those uh, festive uh, projects ready for you to make and put in the shops we're going to look at a little bit of fun stuff so some sci-fi stuff next week and the next couple of weeks a little bit of resin stuff this week so something a little bit more interesting we've done a lot of beginners and basic stuff which is still there for everybody to watch if they want to. So go back and watch some of our early videos if you want to look at how to use the skew chisel, the bowl gouge, how certain jaws work, centers work, all those sorts of things. For now, though, we're going to do one of these lovely little resin pots. And I've, I've done a few resin projects for you before. And I like I've always said, keep the resin projects to start with very small. Resin isn't cheap. It can be fairly expensive. So if you have a disaster with a project, you want it to be a small disaster, not a large one. That's the way I look at it anyway. So let's just have a quick look at the project we're going to do today. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, where that project come from or how it was cast. But here we are, just a very simple shape, just a little bowl. Um, this is uh, a hazel stick and clear resin bowl. Nothing difficult as in form, just a very basic curve flat bottom um so just a pleasing piece um of craft i think okay to sit on the table and like i say nothing too big at all if you wanted to take one move on from there then i've done another one of these this is a darker pigment in this resin then this one's just put onto a little pedestal so uh a little uh, a raised bowl form there again okay just so you can take these as far as you want to you can make them as big as you want to once you've started learning how to do it like i said this is to start with nice and small as a project i've used um uh, a pigment in here i've used a, um, a burnt umber pigment so just to darken it so it's not going to be clear like the other one so i'm relying on the contrast between the timber and the resin in this case um, and Ben's got some stills for me. We're just going to have a look at a few stills. Now, the, the stills that I've put in today really just show the, the casting and, and where we start with it. The molds that I've chosen aren't specific to the project. They're latex molds or from, um, from the internet, and they're baking molds, basically, um, or uh, to not baking molds, but to um, ice um you know to, to cast ice that sort of stuff but they're very pliable um and all i do then is just roughly um lay out the the bits of stick um so cut loads up roughly lay out so i know how many i'm going to need then once i've got a rough idea i'll put them into a, a little mixing tub cover them in resin before i put them back in the same order um and then uh, fill sort of halfway with resin and then you may just see behind that picture there some smaller molds now i put those inside so it doesn't take up as much mold in the actual cast that leaves me then if we come back to camera two ben that leaves me then with a nice hollow piece so this is all that's where the other mold was so i don't all that there is not full of uh resin i didn't need to, i'm not going to need to turn it out um and uh, it saves me a little bit of money at the end of the day um, i'm going to use the tail stock in this project just as long as possible because i'm actually um holding this piece in the chuck um on a glue block and i've um, used epoxy resin glue to glue this um pot on and yeah just have a look, quick look at camera three there ben um, if you look here, so I've used a bit of plywood, so you know a bit of laminated timber, engineered um, engineered material, as opposed to straight timber. Timber's a little bit soft; you've got grain, a weak spot, as it were, running through. So all I've done is epoxy resin that on, turned it through, and then it's held in my O'Donnell jaws, the one one two O'Donnell jaws. And uh, yes, Ben, we got a question. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so first one from Frederick. How do you make sure that the wood is dry, especially in this current climate? Um, water affects resin. 
Um, he's the same. Uh, absolutely, Freddie. You've got to use absolutely bone dry stuff. Um, I'll be completely honest with you. I know this is dry because I know how long we've had it. Um, but I've made a couple of earlier pots that um, were just for some sticks out the back that I've kept in here for a few weeks. And because of their diameter, I knew that they were they were fairly well dry. They were dead wood anyway on the floor. So for that reason, it, it was worked. Um, how do you know it's dry? You could use a, a, a moisture meter if you wanted to. Um, but after a while, you'll understand, which is when you pick a piece up, when you cut it on the bandsaw, look at the shavings, fill this the dust, you know, is it dry dust that's coming off? So you'll get an understanding then. That, that's the best way I can describe, really. Yes, Ben. And Paul says, hi, Colin. Um, can you only turn small boxes from spindle blanks or will small bowl blanks and timber planks work? Absolutely. You know, the resin is the um, the strength in this. And now I've, I've spoken to you about this um, before in terms of types of resin. And we know that epoxy resin has structurally the strongest bond on timber, um, whereas things like um, uh, polyester resin, for instance, wouldn't have a very um, strong bond. Uh, bond so no good for river tables that sort of thing and and this sort of project either so epoxy resin this particular epoxy resin is the eco epoxy um but there's lots of resins that are that are intended for casting um as in um uh, epoxy resins and they're definitely the ones to go for for this type of job we need that strength that structural strength if it's just making pens polyester resin is fine but for this sort of thing it's epoxy all the time yes and Lazarus is asking, did you put it in a vacuum chamber to draw the air bubbles out? Okay, so this will we'll dispel a couple of myths straight away. Vacuum chambers, like you said, they take out the air. They expel it completely. Um, I would, if I wanted to, if I was worried about bubbles in this particular project, though, I would go to a pressure pot. So where we shrink the bubbles into non-existence. That's, that's what I'm doing here. Um, would do here normally and generally a pressure pot is a much bigger vessel than a vacuum chamber um, just because of physics you get a much you can you're able to create a much bigger uh, chamber for for pressure um, i haven't bothered with this i'm using eco epoxy it's a very slow curing resin and in this case it's dry ready to turn in about four to five days um if it's particularly cold even longer because it's got a very open um, cure time the bubbles are able to escape so that, that makes a big difference. I still do a sealing coat. So once I've um, uh, coated all of the pieces in resin and put them back in their mold, I'll leave that 24 hours before I put the main pour in. Um, and that helps, again, just to seal the blanks uh, properly, lets the, the, the some of the air out before you do the main pour. But it's the open time. It's the curing time. The longer it is, the better it is for bubbles if you're not going to uh, vacuum or pressure it. Okay, and then uh, one from Blitz here. Do you use a release spray when you use a resin, or are those molds okay without the release spray? I've used spray. both. It's definitely easier with release spray, um, but it will work without. Um, it just it's just a bit harder to do. But you know, if you've got release spray, use it. It will definitely make the job uh, a lot easier. Yeah. And uh, one from Fuller. Um, with reference to gluing blocks um, for wood to wood. Would you use a layer of craft paper um, and then cleave the pieces away after finishing? Uh, wood to wood. If you're um, if you are split turning, that's what it's referred to as. If you're split turning, um, you can. You, I tend to use card. So you know the card that you get, the sort of thickness of, of card that you get on the, the the back side of a writing pad, for instance. So around about a point. A mill and a half, I would have said. So probably a sixteenth of an inch. Um, that's that's about the the thickness I'd use. You can use blotting paper as well. They do the same thing. Um, I have heard of people using uh, newspaper, but for me, it's a bit thin. I like to be able to get the knife in. So yeah, that's what I do. And I and for that, I'll use a PVA glue. So water-based PVA glue. I, I find that much easier than to peel apart at the end. Yes. Um, and then we've got one from Malcolm here. Um, is the sealing coat the same resin? Yeah, it is exactly the same resin, no difference. And if you're doing bigger pours, you always put a sealing coat on to, um, to seal the grain in to stop those air bubbles coming away from the timber as it soaks in. So you do that first stage, 24 hours, then do your main pour or or two, your first of two or three pours, depending on what you're doing, you know. And then there's a lot of interest in the actual um, the process of the molding. Um, they're asking potentially, could they would we be able to see the, the molding process, the pouring and, and all that? Yeah, definitely. We'll do that. I haven't got that to, to do today because of the, the length of the project. Um, but yeah, absolutely. We will do that. Um, 
uh, we'll do another uh, another resin project in the very near future. How's about that? Right, I think we better get on and do a little bit of turning. Um, we are very quickly do the outside. We're going to show you the, the first parts of, of sanding and finishing as well. And don't worry, there is no need to go down to really, really fine grades of abrasive here. We're going to stop at 600. Um, and we're going to put an oil finish on this. And the oil finish is like putting another resin on. It covers up all the scratches. And it's exactly that. If you're um, uh, sanding between pores of resin, say you've let it go off too hard, then you can stop at 240. 350 you know you don't have to go really really fine because the resin completely fills all the scratches and you, it, it covers them up completely you don't see a thing completely clear that's what we're going to do here so it's a nice easy uh, finish as well i'm going to burn through this nice and quickly so we can concentrate on the inside also um so let's go we're going to start with a bowl gouge and then we're going to go to a negative rake scraper or a common way signature skew. You know it had to come. So let's start. So nice and slow. Turn the lathe on. Turn the speed up. We're going to use a couple of different jaws as well. i got a set of wood plate jaws that I've made for this project. Well, covers this project and coasters. So we'll look at those also. So first off, let's go straight in with the gouge. I'm going to start with a fairly hefty 3.8 uh, bowl gouge. And just rough out. If you've never turned resin before... I'm keeping my mouth shut as I do it because I will fill my mouth with uh, with resin bits otherwise. If you've never turned resin before, um, it is different than timber. There is no grain to resin. Different uh, resins work differently as well. So eco epoxy is softer compared to things like glass gas, which is more of a chippy uh, resin, but it's a quick, quicker drying resin. Eco epoxy is slower um, to dry and softer to turn. So I like it for turning um, bigger pieces. I'm going to shut my mouth now. Just do a bit of turning a minute. I'm just going to stop stop the lathe, see where we are. I know there's a bit more to do. We've got little voids like this that need to be addressed. I've got to get back to that solid timber. The top's working well. A few air bubbles we can take out, but a little bit more in that center area. Now, there's plenty of resin in there, so I'm not at all worried. We're straightening out the curve a little bit. stop check there now we're getting there still a little bit more to do here look so we're still covered up a little bit and in this one but it's getting there that's where we want to be so a little bit more plenty of material thickness so a little bit straighter and i think that'll be it Stop and have a check. The, the, the shape is nice, quite pleasing. There we are. We're fine. There's a little bit left, but in my cleaning up now, we're going to get rid of that. And I'm going to clean up with, and I was, wasn't was joking when I said the skew chisel. The skew chisel makes a fantastic um, scraper for this sort of thing. Negative rake is where we want to be for this. So I'm going to go straight with the, the skew. I'm going to go with the 32 mil signature skew. And if I need to, we can take our diamond file. 
and, and just give a couple of little sweeps just to put a little bit of a, a more of aggressive burr on it, but not too much. I want this to be calm. I don't want to be hanging on to the thing. So before I do that, let me just clean up this top edge so I can clean it all up together. Let's go with a smaller gouge to do that. It's a little quarter inch. Have a double check. So a couple of little voids just there. You can see in the top there, another one there. So just a little bit further. Oh, that should be it, hoping. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so right on the outside edge. I'm not worried about the, the inside. That uh, Most of that's going to go, but we're there. So now I can tidy up that area down there with the skew, like I said. I'm going to turn the speed up a little bit. When I was using the bowl gouge, I didn't want the speed too fast. And the reason being that the bevel rubs, of course, when we're using a bowl gouge, if you we're turning really, really fast with resin and the bevel's rubbing throughout the cut, you're going to get things start to melt. So it's different with a scraper because there's no bevel rubbing. Um, so I can turn the speed up a little bit and get a little bit of a finer cut. Remember, you're not only scraping resin, you are scraping timber as well. So be delicate. So this form, the outside is is uh, by far the easiest to turn. I can't scrape the inside because by the time I get to the inside, um, I want to complete the whole form. And that means this is going to be quite a thin piece. So trying to scrape a very thin piece will shatter it. So I'm only going to be able to scrape the outside. I'm going to have to rely on my bowl gouge finish on the inside to, to give me a good a good finish. So I'm going to now sand that. That's not looking too bad at all. We're going to wet sand this, but we're going to wet sand with oil, not water. And the reason that I'm doing that is if you, whatever you sand with in terms of liquid will penetrate the timber. Now, water means that you'll then have to wait for that water to evaporate out, potentially swelling the timber and causing other issues with oil it's going to soak in a nice long way and that is the finish that's going to dry fairly rapidly especially with our warm sanding toward the end as well so ben we got another question yes sorry um so a question from chris here um how do you best dispose of the resin shavings i put them in the bin um they're not to go into uh, the compost where we've had um things like wood shavings go they do go into the bin at this time they're uh, they're not recyclable um so you will have to get rid of them in your waste bin where all the other non-recyclable bits go um but unfortunately at the moment now ecopoxy um boasts that 80 percent of the um the content of the the epoxy is plant-based they're working to 100 percent. but whatever happens once it's set it's still non-biodegradable um, and I got this from Marcus. He's saying, hi, Colin. On a previous show, you said that your wife signs all your work. Um, does that mean that you're going to be renaming your signature skew after? <laughs> that was the only uh, thing that was from my hand in terms of um, um, signature. Um, that is me. Um, that's why my wife signs all my work. <laughs> um, and, and from Jenny, she's, um, she's making her um, uh, non-slip and sanding discs uh, what glues would you recommend to attach the sandpaper and the non-slip fabric um so on our sanding discs here what i use is a velcro type material so a hook and loop and i use um this where are we the same on the um the discs and so this is a self-adhesive roll of the hook material 
Okay, I buy this from Axminster, from Axminster Tools, sold in um, 100 mil wide by a meter long, self-adhesive, um, and don't look, don't search by putting in uh, hook and loop, search with heavy duty, and it'll be one of the main hits that come up. Okay. Um, Tom, sorry, Tom is behind the scenes um, uh, working um, to put all the links in. So, Tom, if you could find, if you put in heavy duty, and then if you put the link into the Velcro, the hook and loop system for everybody. Yes, Ben. Um, Elios is out there. Um, just wanted to share a love of the, the Colwyn Way SKU. Um, they got one, and they're really enjoying using it. And what else have we got here? Have you ever used CA glue to fill any air bubbles or voids? Um, I haven't used CA. I've used um, uh, the epoxy resin glue, so I, I tend to use that one quite a lot. That's a really, really good one to use. Um, does the same thing. It is the uh, uh, Z-poxy, so it's a um, an actual adhesive, but I use that all the time. I even use that as a clear coat on fishing lures as well. It's really, really good epoxy resin. But to, because it dries quickly, as a as opposed to the, the the regular casting resin, so that that's what I tend to go with. Yeah. And then Kenneth's um, asking about the waste again, but we've talked about that. Um, it's just straight in the bin. Um, would the um, would the shavings damage a vacuum filter? Um, no, no, they're no different than wood shavings. Um, the the issue is with them though. What you have got. So if you are doing large turnings. They produce string shavings like that. Um, they will break, but if you get them in a large group, you know, it, it tends to, to harden up and you can get them caught around the fan. So just be aware of that you might need to clean the fan from, from time to time. But those are the shavings that you get. A little bit careful. Yes, Ben. And Frederick would like to know, um, did you cast the bowl in one piece or did you use a core? Um, a cast in one piece. And I put another little mold on the inside so I didn't need to put quite so much resin in. Yeah. All right. Yeah, good. Right, we're going to sand. I'm going to use, just to start with, 150 grit. Put the dust extraction on. I'm not going to use um, oil just yet. Let's just get our main sanding done first. What I want to do, like it, like normal sanding, just get rid of um, turning lines. This particular abrasive I'm using is uh, perforated. It's uh, an abronet style of abrasive uh, which is really good for resin actually because you can use it with liquid um, it'll keep things cool because you've got lots of air in between the sanding 150 grit remember you could go coarser but then you've got to chase those scratches away don't forget right let's just have a quick look it does take a lot longer than timber be aware of that Sanding epoxy takes a while. Right, we're going to turn the lay speed down a little bit. And I'm going to add oil. Stand to one side just to make sure. And we're going to start sanding. But the beauty of adding oil means that the slurry can't create a barrier. So it, it stays as a slurry as opposed to a solid. So you can sand and sand and sand. This is a trick that we do with um, very resinous timbers as well. So those oily timbers that clog the paper up, use a bit of oil and that'll keep that nice and liquid, keep the abrasive abrading. There we are. So that's enough with the 150. We're gonna now go to, so that's a 180. And then 240, 400, 600, like normal. I'm rushing through this. Um, you're going to take your time. All right. The better you, the longer you spend doing this, the better the finish is going to be. There we go. That'll do for that one so we now go to 240 i'll spend a little bit longer on the, the finer coats um, the oil that i'm using is finishing oil particular ones chestnut finishing oil but uh, any of the finishing oils work equally as well in fact any of the oils i found work really really well just go for a nice thin one don't go for anything that's too thick
So this is 240, remember, this, uh, this abrasive. There we are. Let's go a little bit finer now. So we go with the 400. If you're not keen on um, getting oil on your hands, then maybe a set of um, uh, latex gloves or something like that would be good. Don't wear thick mesh gloves. You don't want to get caught up in the lathe, but latex that will snap or break if it gets caught in the lathe might be a good option. There we are. That's, that's a 400 grit. I'm nearly there. We go one more, 600. Yes, while I'm doing this, I'm gonna answer a question from Ben. Yes, Ben. Um, so Fuller's asking, can the oil also be used as a as a cutting lubricant um, to use with chisels to reduce heat buildup? Shout that again. So um, can the oil also be used as a cutting lubricant for your chisels? Um, not really, and the reason being that the, you're going to be um, you're going to be fighting lathe speed there. We can't have oil on the piece liquid whilst it's running at a cutting speed. The speed is um, going to be too fast and you'll have a face full of oil. Uh, it'll also be a really messy job as well. Um, you can't go as slow that's required for oil because the chisels will grate and, and um, cause too much uh, pressure on the workpiece. So it just won't work. Speed is your enemy on that, unfortunately. There we are. I'm going to leave the sanding. I can say you're going to spend a lot longer than I have there. We're going to just turn off that extractor for a minute. Clean my hands up as best I can and wipe off the excess. Now you've got a lot of slurry on here, so we're going to wipe off all that excess. We can add a little bit more oil just basically to wash the outside clean because you've got shavings, sorry, you've got dust and oil making that hard paste. Now, what you will notice, and you've seen all that, I'm sure, if you've watched any um, resin casting or finishing on uh, social media, you, that, that magic moment where they put the oil on, what happens is you get that complete translucency when you put a liquid on. Um, it's always a magic moment. There we are. That's that's a nice little finish. This is quite soft. My only concern with this little bowl is the, are these small pieces. These small pieces were that deadwood that I said that I, I picked from underneath the trees a few um, a few weeks ago. These are solid. There's no problem with these, but these are very soft. So I'm just going to be a little bit delicate with those. Okay, so we can remove the tailstock, get that out of the way. I'm going to have to move, take that right the way off just for the minute so I can get into the bowl. And we're just going to, I'm not going to take any chances. I'm just going to make a nice, or try and make a nice pleasing shape. I'm going to go with a small gouge. I may have to step away from the camera briefly to sharpen it if it, if it uh, dulls, because one thing with resin, it will, will dull the tool quite quickly. Okay, there we are. So let's lay speed to zero, turn the lathe on. You hear me say that all the time. It's something that um, that becomes habit. Turn the lathe to, to zero, turn the lathe on. It's um, when you change something on the lathe or you change your angle, I just find it's a little bit safer to do. So let's just start taking just little cuts. And I can't turn the whole um, the whole bowl in one here. I have to do this in stages. If I try and do it in one big hit, what will happen is it'll just shatter. This is a very soft, barky timber I'm using. So I'm just roughing out the the uneven inside first. 
There we go. So now I can start working on the actual thickness. All my previous ones have been around about three mil, a fraction under three millimeters. I'm going to stay a little bit thicker on this one for the reason I've just talked about, the fact that that bit of timber that we're using, those small pieces are very soft. But I'm going to check. I'm going to check right at the early stage. They're holding okay. <laughs> They're holding okay. Uh, let's go one more cut, as they say. That'll do us a little bit more in terms of depth. And then a little bit more thickness. What we don't want to have is um, a visible join between your two cuts. So stop fairly regularly and look for any of those marks. I'm going to turn the big bright light on just briefly, just to see. And I've got a ridge. I've got to get rid of that ridge. I don't know whether you can see that from those angles. Cut number two, Ben. There is a ridge between my first and second cut. That needs to come away. So let's do that. Yes, Ben, whilst the lay's off. Um, so we've, got a, we've got a couple of questions here. Um, first one from Callum. He's asking if you've ever seen a Canadian woodturner, Jim Spar Sparky. Um, his videos on resin bowls are very helpful. Um, Colin, um, I see a lot of other turners use carbide scrapers. Um, do you recommend them, or are, or are you just more comfortable using the gouges? Um, carbide scrapers are used fairly frequently with resin. It, resin reacts well. I would say with carbide scraper, though, I would still go negative rake. You can still get negative rake carbide tips for them. Um, I would use them all the time. But, yeah, it does. Um, I Because I'm fairly at home with a gouge and a skew, they're my, they're my go-tos, really, and it works for me. Um, one thing that resin won't allow you to do is have a catch. So if you do get a dig in or catch with a gouge, you will um, rake a lot of resin out and potentially explode the piece. So that's probably the reason a lot of people go with carbide. Um, and I would certainly... Um, I, I certainly wouldn't um, disagree with those people that are using them, absolutely. And you see shavings come off. It, it, resin just reacts well to a scraper. Yeah. And Martin's um, saying he's recently got some logs of cherry. After doing his first wet turn on a bowl, um, he's got some big cracks despite leaving it very chunky. Any tips, please? Um, yeah. I mean, if, if there's any of the core in there at all, any of the pith of the, of the, the tree in there, it will go there, in those areas. Um, Fruit timbers do tend to be quite prone to it as well. I would say once they've gone, they've gone. You may find that they close up as it starts to dry a little bit, but the crack will always be there. Um, I would, this time of the year is difficult in the UK for drying because it's quite hot, or we hope it to be hot. Um, but we're coming into the autumn spell. That's the best time to, talk, to start rough turning. Keep them in a, a cool um, undrafty, uh, darkish space, and don't let any direct sunlight or, or lots of um, uh, change in temperature get to them. And you can seal the end grain still, um, but then, yeah, it's a case of leaving them. You will win some, you will lose some. And can we have a reminder for Cliff what sort of oil was used for the sanding? Yep, so I was just using finishing oil. So any of your oil that you've got at home, is, doesn't the brand doesn't matter, nor the type, but this one was finishing oil. But any of the, the fruit oils will work, so lemon oil, um, citrus, you know, citrus oils, um, anything really. Um, I also, uh, you know, things like food safe oils, another good one. So there, I was just taking away that join, and I think I've just got that there. It felt right. That's good. So now we'll go down a little bit further. The 
just getting to the bottom of the bowl where all the resin is caught. Stop and double check. Looking for those join lines, remember. I don't want to see a join. We're okay. We can go a bit thinner, though. That's starting to bulk up a little bit. So I'm just you losing that um, consistent thickness. Stop and have another check. There we are. Nice and even again. Now we can move on to the next bit. So you see what we're doing? We're, we're doing one stage at a time, taking about 10 mil, three eighths of an inch away at once, and then moving down to the next stage, taking away the join line at the same time as well. Um, we're now down to about halfway, so I can now start taking out the bottom. Yes, Ben. So uh, Callum again, he's, he's talking about um, drying the roughed out bowls. Um, his ash ones have moved uh, more than the beech ones. Is that caused because of the the species of timber? Yeah, yeah, that's all it is. All it is. It might there. There's a little bit of difference in where you cut them as well. Um, I tend to work with the tree, and so my uh, the top of my bowl is facing center. That's the way I tend to do it, and it, it seems to curl around that point. Then you see, and that works for me a little bit easier. And another question on drying um, from Stephen. He's asking what's best for drying and turning laburnum um, up to five, six inch diameter. Um, and have you done much yourself? Um, lots of laburnum, actually. Now, five to six inches, you're on the verge. If you want to try and dry it solid, then leave it in five to six foot long lengths and stand it up and forget about it. But usually for that size, it'll take about two to two and a half years to dry completely. Um, and you will get some success. You will still lose um, some of, off of each end, but you, like I say, right on the verge of, of not being able to keep it solid on that size. Um, if you wanted to turn it into smaller bowls and smaller pieces, then just cleft it right the way through the middle and let it dry, and you'll be guaranteed less cracking there. Yes, Ben? And this, this one from Frederick. Um, do you ever mess up a job? Um, he knows <laughs> catches can be a design opportunity, um, so do whatever to employ that. Frederick, if you, you've been watching all of these videos, you know I mess up fairly frequently. Um, I never want to hear the name Weevil again, of course. Um, but yeah, no, we all get catches, we all get dings, and um, we all wish that we'd never made that final cut. Absolutely. The, 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 the better you get, the more practice you get, the more uh, chances you take, as you should do. You should be pushing the boundaries of what you can make every time. Um, it's like, uh, it's like a runner will always push himself a little bit further. It's the same in turning, same as any craft. So I'm pushing myself all the time. I've smashed my fair share of these, um, just because I've been lazy and not concentrate where the chisel tip is, um, and suddenly get a cat. So yeah, there's lots of reasons that you're going to get diggings. And Callum would like to know, um, if there's any update and when we're going to, um, do pressure pots for resin. Um, no, I keep asking the question, um, I don't, at the moment, no, sorry, Callum, I don't have a, a, an answer for you, but I will keep plugging away. Um, when we find that right supplier, then I'll let you know first. All right. Okay, so I'm going to carry on with the bottom now. At the moment, it's pretty much solid resin, so I'm just going to keep taking that away. So we're on a quarter inch gouge here, six mil.
Okay, so I'm down to the bottom. Yeah, brilliant. You can see that. I'm down to the bottom bit of timber. Now, I know now that I'm getting close because I put one piece right on the very bottom. It was around about a quarter of an inch to six mil thick. So I know how much I've got to play with there. So I'm going to clean up this line and we'll start bringing the shape around. Right, I did a little bit of tidying up too, but I just want to check the curve before I go any further. That's okay. Happy with that. I'm not going to push it on this one because we've got a very limited time frame. But like I say to you guys, you know, and girls, just keep keep those cuts nice and smooth. You'll be so grateful when it comes to the sanding process. Otherwise, you'll be chasing uh, marks away for ages. Yes, Ben. Um, so uh, another question from El Elios. Um, does your six millimeter gouge have the same profile or angle as your larger bowl gouges or is it different? Uh, all the same, 55 degree bevel angle. What you'll find um, is if, so this, this, this is quite an open form. This is quite an open curve. If you've got a very tight curve, um, you may want to put a secondary bevel on the heel of your gouge. Um, no given angle, um, I suppose 45 degrees if you wanted one. But uh, So 55 de degree main angle, uh, 45 on the secondary. And then that will give you more of a convex curve to flow around that inner curve. And that will help minimize any ridging that you get on the inside of a bowl. That, that works especially on tight radiuses. Yeah. And James would like to um, know, he's, he's talking about the Hampshire Sheen um, finishes. Um, did you know that we've got they doing a new citrus oil and that um, our axmints are going to be stocking it? I believe we are. I believe. I hope I'm not um, putting too much spoiler out there, and I hope uh, Martin's allowing us to, to to have it. But yeah, I believe we are. The question was asked the other day, actually. Yes. And Frederick's asking: um, Does resin dull the tools any quicker than, um, say, oak or other usual turning wood? It does. Yeah, absolutely does. Um, you'll notice a difference almost immediately. Um, I will have to sharpen those gouges when this is over. I can't just go straight on to the next project. Let's get a brush to apply this. A bit, a bit more oil required. The Simbas sounds fairly quickly. It's the, the resin that takes the time. I'm not pushing too hard. I'm purposely going through it a lot quicker than I would do, though, so bear that in mind. You will need to sand a lot longer than I'm sanding here. So now we're on to the final grades, 400 grit. This is not going to be a transparent piece. The one that I showed you, the finished one I showed you earlier was because we had no pigment in it. Um, this one is, and this has got quite a, a heavy pigment. I'll probably put about four drops of burnt umber in here. There we are, now 600 grit. Yes, Ben. 
Um, so Callum's asking, uh, well, he says he's got the same lathe that you're using, uh, but struggling to use the skew on a larger diameter vase. Um, he's, he was making due to the tool rest, due to not being able to get the tool rest high enough. Um, any tips on, on how to approach larger diameter pieces? It is an issue. It's an issue with most lathes because the tool rest is designed to go probably, probably about 12 mil above center height and no further. Um, and when you're doing sort of four, five, six inch newels and things like that, you need that that skew higher. Um, no, there there isn't a way. There is no quick fix, unfortunately, Callum. So you have to learn to be able on those bigger pieces to be able to um, drop that handle down low, bevel rub, and um, have that tool rest a little bit lower than is comfortable. Just be careful of that that long toe tip, um, of course. So you have, just have keep your wits about you on that one. That's that's the only advice I can give you. And James has said um, he's been given some large wood slices, um, probably too big for this sort of thing, but any ideas what to turn with them? Um, yeah, loads of things, loads of things. I mean, you can look for egg cups. You can do uh, miniature fruit goblets. You can do um, you can do the craft fair favourites, some toadstools, for instance. Um, there's a huge amount of projects that you can, uh, you can do. Have a look online for inspiration. Pinterest is a great one to look at um youtube obviously is a great one but yeah lots of things out there and good books you know get yourself a, a good library of wood turning books they're always a continual source of, of great inspiration for, for wood turners pottery books as well so uh, in terms of um, throwing pots have a look at the forms that you get from pottery um they will give you great inspiration for bowl turning and things so yeah all of those Look at other people's work. The only thing I would say, if you're copying somebody, make sure you acknowledge them as well. There we are. Let's have a quick look. That's quite pretty, isn't it? That color works well. Um, completely different type of bowl than this one. Like I say, this is a clear resin, this one. Um, but when you compare the, the two, they do look... Nice contrast, I suppose. Um, right, we need to take that off and uh, and clean the base up. I'll give you a better look. Mike, I'll give you a better look at this one. In fact, no, I'm not going to pass it off. What am I doing? I don't want to take it off yet. I want to remove as much of this before I start holding it in another jaw because it won't take a lot of pressure. I'm going to be gripping on the outside of this bowl here. So I don't want to create too much work for myself um, and too much stress for the bowl. So nothing touching the tool rest. Make sure the tool rest is firm. What speed am I at? I'm at 1,300 revs, revs there, everybody. And nice, gentle cuts. So we're just getting a little bit of build up now. I want to go to the scraper in a minute. There we are. So now we'll scrape and then we'll part and then we'll reverse. Just being fairly delicate here. Stop and have a look. Yeah, happy with that. So now parting tool. And we should be able to ease a little bit more. Let's turn it down a wee bit. We should be able to ease a little bit more of that base away.
Do a little bit of a side scrape now with this with the passing tool. And there we are. Stop and have a quick check before I finish parting off. Happy with that. So I'm going to hold on. I'm going to try and move my arm away so you can see what's happening. So I'm parting the little wooden chuck. I'm not parting the timber in the pot. So if anything breaks, it'll be the chuck. Yes, Ben. So a question from James. Um, would the oil cure on the resin and be a lasting finish, or would you wax on the top? No, I'd leave the oil. The, the, the oil will leave a nice finish. And Frederick's asking, um, would you recommend using the wheel buffing system to polish the bottom? Uh, be careful with buffing. Yes, it does work. You have to get the right compounds. And look at uh, Final Stage Plastics for a compound, which I believe is either the blue or the pink. You'll have to have to check that online. There we are. So look, what we've done, um, what we've done, we've parted the um, plywood away, little nib of plywood there. So we're going to take that away now by holding in another set of jaws, and then we can sand this, this bottom piece. But so far, we're okay. So far. So let's get our other jaws on. You've seen me use these jaws before. A wood plate jaws. Really, really useful jaws. I like button jaws. Um, I really do. But for me, having a set of jaws you can customize to suit the project you're working on is really useful. So I tend to use a lot of button, a lot of wood plate jaws, a lot of what we call soft jaws, we're actually made out of nylon, um, things that you can then make bespoke to the project. So there we are. So this is the set for today. Now this is my coaster making set. And that is just going to be big enough. Which is lucky. Which, well, it's not lucky. If, if I wanted to make that bigger, the smaller, sorry, I would just turn another, another recess. Yeah. Nice and gentle. Don't take any risks with this. Just be just be gentle. Tiny little cuts. Tiny little cuts with a very blunt chisel now. And we're back to sanding again. So we'll go with our oil. And then we'll lay speed down. Lay speed down to keep yourself protected from being splattered by oil.
So we're going to go down to 400 grit already. Remember what I said, though, you're going to sand for a lot longer than I am. Make sure you get rid of all your marks. Grand, right, let's have a look and see what we've got. Give yourself a good clean off first. Get rid of all the excess oil on here. Like I said, if you want to grab a little bit more oil out of, uh, out of the tin just to clean the surface off, fantastic. Uh, just help get rid of some of that, that buildup of slurry. I think that's... I think that's okay. Let's get some clean tissue as well. Yeah, that's quite pleasing. I like that. A little bit of resin just built up around that top edge a minute. There we are. Yes, Ben. Um, so we've got a couple of questions about the wood plate jaws. Um, they've not seen them before. Um, how did it tighten up onto the onto the bowl? Okay, let's have a look. I'll show you. We'll get that out there as well. I can be looking at that whilst I'm talking. There we are. So it's a different look to to the clear one. Absolutely, but equally as attractive and they do make really really nice sort of talking points so the difference only with this one is that i put a few spots of pigment in with the resin that was the only thing and that you do during um the, the um, casting process i'll we'll leave them on the table just for the minute just while we're talking so wood plate jaws. Yes, so I've used lots of wood plate jaws, but what you may have seen is they just look a little bit different because they're all different sizes. I, I make the jaws to suit a project. Now, in the past, I've used these for holding coasters to clean up the underside of a coaster. I'm used doing offset coasters. But basically, if I take these out, I'll show you the wood plate jaw is the actual back of the jaw. So it's the metal piece. You then customize your quadrants to suit the project you're doing. So let me take one out. So there we there we have it. So this is the wood plate jaw itself. Tom, maybe you could put up the the um, the links to the wood plate jaws or jaw plates as we know them online. And then this fits to your um, accessory mounting jaws in the same way every other jaw does. So you first fit this to the mounting jaw, then you fit your piece of wood to the wood plate jaw. Okay, via screws, you can see the screws there. So you have to be fairly wise as to where you place um, where you place your grooves, or go for thicker pieces of ply. Ply better than solid timber because ply doesn't have um, a weak spot. It's, it's obviously it's a laminate. Don't use um, MDF; it's not strong enough. It delaminates very quickly. So good quality plywood without the void. So don't go cheap um, ply. Go this is birch ply. This one it's solid all the way through. Um, and they will last me a long, long time. I've probably got about four different sizes of wood plate jaw, as in the, the top wooden piece, um, for some for bigger bowls, some for specifics like these coasters, um, some for jewellery. I've got some very small 50 mil ones for jewellery. But that's the beauty of them. You can customise them to your project. Okay. There we are. Are there any more questions, Ben? No, I think that's it. Are we done? Lovely. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that little project. It's a fun project. I, this is the, the thing sometimes is I need to have some um, some things that inspire me as well. And these little, little uh, what I call twig bowls, um, are really nice ones. They're saleable items. They're, they don't take up a huge amount of room. Um, and you don't need to charge the earth for them like you would a big piece. However, if you've enjoyed doing that and you want to go into the bigger pieces, 
absolutely. You know, you can go onwards and upwards, just take all the precautions, of course. So I hope you've enjoyed that, everybody. Um, don't forget, if you enjoy what we do, I say it every single time, like, share, um, subscribe, you know, do all the things um, and give us a thumbs up. You know, make sure that we know that uh, we're doing the right thing. And, uh, and if we're not, tell us. Um, come back tomorrow for more Woodworking Wisdom. But thanks for dropping by. I'll see you again. Bye-bye.